Swami Surat Shananda. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank Reverend Helen Silmer and Dr. Nicholas Coleman for organizing this interfaith congregation on the occasion of the World Interfaith Harmony Week 2018. So here we are to speak on the stories of creation of the various religions. So I've been from the Hindu faith. Just to let you know, for all the various uh, beliefs, various faiths in the Hinduism, there are so many varied faiths in the Hinduism, if there is any core philosophy to which all adhere, it is the Vedanta philosophy. All, whether it is a Vaishnava, or it is a Shaiva, or it is a dualistic school, or it is a non-dualistic school, it is qualified non-dualism, whatever it may be, the Vedanta is the core scripture, is the core philosophy to which all belongs. Now, that way, the story of creation can be quite big. In just if we have to reflect on what the idea of creation is in Vedanta, you will find a wonderful way of looking at the creation which the Vedanta propounds. It's not only one, there are mainly three vadas, three propositions of the theory of creation as we find in the Vedanta philosophy. It's very interesting, you will find as we go through this, at last we will come to a belief that all the various religions is actually looking at the same truth from the various perspective. This building, if I look, take a photo from the east, if I take a photo from the west, from the north, from the south, all the four will be different pictures. But it is the picture of the same building, taken from different angles. And that's what Vedanta speaks of. That all these so-called apparent varied propositions, theories, are actually looking at the same truth from various angles. It's not as such something varied. They're speaking the same truth from various angles. And that's how they came to these three different propositions of the theory of creation. So let me name them what are the three propositions, two vadas, three philosophies, uh, three uh, so-called the propositions of creation. First is srishti drishti vada. In Sanskrit, srishti means creation, drishti means seeing, vision. Srishti drishti, first comes creation, then comes perception. That's the first. We will come to it in big details. There's not scope for a very vast discussion, but we will find that it's so interesting. First is Srishti Drishti Vada. The next is Ajata Vada. That creation actually never happened. Ajata. There is no creation. There's a second theory. The third is Drishti Srishti. It's just the opposite of the first one. First comes vision, then comes creation. Creation outside is not there as such. The moment I look out, the creation happens. These are the three propositions of Vedanta. And based on all those three propositions, they will come to a conclusion which is called Ek Jiva Bada. There is actually one being which is appearing as many. That's the wonderful theory of synthesis, that unity which the Vedanta speaks of. The one is appearing as many, that all the three vadas at last come to that conclusion. Now, what actually these three vadas speaking of? Let us try to understand in a very nutshell, in a specific way. First comes Srishti Drishti Vada. First is the creation, and then I perceive it. Something has been created, and I am here, I'm just pursuing that. And all the religions believe, what's the basic difference of religion and science? They all speak of unity, that we are all stardust, but that stardust, the science will say, is inert matter. And all the religion varies there. They say, yes, we also speak of unity, but it has started from consciousness. Consciousness is not a byproduct of matter that somehow matter conglomerated and consciousness came out, not a single religion believes in that. Not a single religion. 
the, all the religion believes consciousness is the basic principle. That's the fundamental principle. Whether we name it as God or Allah or Brahman, whatever we may say it, it is the basic fundamental conscious principle. Creation comes later. And after the creation comes, I see it. Now, this, all the stories, after all, the basic thing is that, that there is a conscious principle who has created. Just now we heard the same thing. The conscious principle is creating. There is a being who creates. And science actually contradicts that. But I will say, present in the modern day science have started echoing the concepts of religion. They have started saying, without taking consciousness, as the fundamental, one of the fundamental realities, we can never explain matter. We can never. Just, we won't go to the details. A small thing we will say that if really conscious, is really consciousness an accident that by the conglomeration of matter suddenly it has appeared? Not a single religion believes it. Even in science you will find it's very difficult to believe in that principle. There is a principle called anthropic principle. Anthropic principle is very wonderful that here today we are having this interfaith congregation, it was planned at the moment of the Big Bang. <laughs> because there are so many accidents, the so-called accidents happened in so exact precision. Millions of those accidents that made this conference today possible. Accident can be a singular event. You cannot think of sequence of accidents happening minutely. The Big Bang, just to give an example, if it was the force was a bit more, there wouldn't have been any creation. Everything would have scattered out. If it was a bit less, like a ball I throw up, it comes down to the ground. Everything would have been pulled back and a huge black hole would have been created. There won't have been a creation. It happened in an exact, they say, the force was very, very specific. You may say it was an accident. After that, to form the matter, these electrons, protons, the ratio of the weak, uh, this, uh, what you say, this nuclear force and the strong nuclear force is such that if it would have been bit more or less, matter wouldn't have formed. Again, another accident happened in a specific bay. Like that there are millions of accidents which would have happened in such specific way to form this world. Just come down to this earth. The earth, we say, there is, this is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, the poles. If it was a bit straight, the sun's light would have been so perpendicular, the heat would have been so much, life won't have been possible. If it was a bit more oblique, the temperature would be so less, life won't be possible. You can take such, like, like hundreds of accidents, which has happened one after the other, to make it possible for us to be here today and speak about this, all these various faiths and all. How, if accident can be a singular, it can be a singular occurrence, how can so many accidents, one after the after other, could have happened to create this world? So that speaks of a designer behind the design. That speaks of some conscious principle. And there are various other ways to look at it. Even at the, with a scientific attitude, we can look at it and we if we are not biased, even sometimes the science is biased to just look away from the actual fact. If you are not biased, we will find the echo of consciousness behind the creation. So first comes the creation, and I am, as a product of this creation, am here to look at this creation. And that creation has happened because of the conscious principle. That's what's the basic idea behind Srishti Drishti Vada. First the creation, I am here to look at the creation, and there is a creator, I am the creator looking at his creation. That we find in all the Abrahamic religion, religion Judaism, Judaism, Islam, Christian, whatever the stories may be, that's the basic idea behind it. Even in Hinduism, the Vaishnavas, the other uh, dualistic, those who have a dualistic uh, philosophy, they all believe in it. And it has a sum, uh, what is a correct perspective uh, on based on which these all theories are. You simply cannot deny them. Next we come to the, the next proposition called Ajata Vada. There is no creation at all. It's a very interesting thing. As long as we're looking out, at last we can end in dualism. The creator is there, I am here. 
But when you dive within yourself to really search who am I, a wonderful thing happens. At last, you end up in oneness. That actually, it is you alone who exist. In the words of Jesus, I and my Father are one. And it's the same language the mystics speak in all the religions. It's a very uh, sad thing, one thing has happened. The mystics in all the religion were misunderstood. They were treated as heretics when they spoke of their oneness with the divine. But in Vedanta, that was accepted as a scientific way of reaching the truth. The so-called heretics are now considered as saints. The time has changed, I will say. The religions have reformed. The heretics, the so-called heretics, the mystics, they were branded as heretics. But now, their words are really valued. That mysticism, if you want to find the unity in all the religion, go to the mystics. They speak the same language. In the word of Ramakrishna, there all the fox howls in the same manner. You know, in a forest, if you're one single fox howls, all will be howling. If you really want to find unity among the religions, listen to the mystics. You will find they have discovered that unity principle. How it happens? When you're thinking really intentively, you are not just having some make-beliefs. I just think intentively of God or of any truth. My mind becomes focused in one thought. Whatever the thought may be, whatever may be your belief, if it gets concentrated in one thought, a wonderful thing happens. The mind stops for the time being. You know why? In this world of duality, a wonderful thing you will find. Wherever there is a flow, there is polarity. Water flows from higher level to lower level. If both the levels are same, no flow. Current flows from potential, higher potential, positive potential to negative potential, higher potential to negative potential. If both the ends have same potential, no current. Whenever there is polarity, there is flow. Mind is mind as long as it can jump from thought to thought. If through focused thought, you can keep it in one thought, whether it is the thought of Allah, or it is the thought of God, or it is the thought of Brahman, immaterial of that, when it gets focused, mind stops. Mind is like a prism which is breaking the light into the spectrum. You know, when the light falls on a prism, it breaks into the spectrum. Similarly, the conscious principle in coming in association with the mind breaks into the spectrum of this creation. The moment you stop the mind, the spectrum is no more there. Suddenly, you realize your oneness with that non-local consciousness. And it has happened with all the mystics of all the religions. And there, we find that this Vedanta is speaking of Ajatavada. When your perspective change, you go beyond the mind because of your deep contemplation, existence vanishes, you vanish, your locality vanish, you don't find you are here, you are everywhere. And from there, Mr. Eckhart, every, they will find their language, infinity lies in each and every moment, that then in those days, they were censored like anything. Now we find that they are considered to be the one who is really speaking something true. So there lies the Ajatavada. When you can go beyond the mind, you find that creation is not there. You alone are there. The entire creation lies within you. You are one with that unity of existence. When you come down from that state, then comes the third Vada. That is Drishti Srishti Vada. First perception, then creation. Creation is not out there anymore. Now I understand it is the mind which is breaking the consciousness into the spectrum of this name of, world, name of world and form. To give a common example, when I see a red flower, I think the red flower is out there. It is not out there. The science will say you, there is no color outside. It's a particular wavelength of light which is reflected by that flower. The sunlight falls on it. All the wavelengths are falling on it. A particular wavelength is reflected. That has no color. It touches your eye. Once it touches your eye, it gets converted into nervous current. When it reaches the brain, brain is the darkest part of your body. The light never enters there. Sound never enters there. Just imagine there, not a single perception is entering. Only these nervous currents are entering, and the redness is projected out from there outside. Your brain is a projector which is projecting not only the 3D movie of light and sound, it is projecting five senses, light, sound, touch, uh, and this smell, taste. 
It's a wonderful projector. It's projecting out. Once the, you can understand this basic principle, even through the science is saying that that. Then we find, find a very interesting story. What's the story? The story is that each and every moment the creation is happening within you. It's the mind, the outside reality, what I see is not the reality. It is the map of the reality. It's not the exact thing. To give an example, uh, 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 just you take a, I move out to the Melbourne city to just have a picture of how the roads are. And I come back and draw the highway in red color and all the lanes in green color. A small child sees the map and he thinks there are red roads, green roads out there. Will he ever find it? He will never find it. For my convenience, I have given the color in that map to distinguish the highways from the lens. That's what the mind is doing. This Vyavaharika Satta. This is the something we find in the Buddhism. It is called this subjective idealism. So you will find a wonderful thing. In Vedanta, they have not denied a single theory of creation. All are included, and they say it is looking at the creation from the various perspectives. And all this lit at last to the idea of Eka Jiva Bada. There is only one existence which is appearing as many. And in today's discussion, there is another uh, one uh, subtopic that what is the purpose then of this creation? You will find all the religions actually point to the purpose of creation. There's a purpose. Today, uh, it is in Vedanta they speak of Ladini, that, that ultimate reality is something uh, which is full of bliss. Two minutes? Okay. So this is full of bliss. And now the bliss is something which you have to experience. For experiencing the bliss, you need another. You cannot be one. So to experience his own bliss, he has created this creation. To experience love, he has created this creation. I will end up my discussion with the story of the Bible which actually is reflected even in the Vedanta, the story of the prodigal child, a wonderful story. That a rich man had two sons. The elder was an obedient son. The younger one was a freelancer. He wanted to be free. So he wanted, he claimed for his share of his property. The father had to yield to him. He gave him. But in a short time, he was just, he became a pauper. It means he lost all the wealth. He was not a responsible young man. And now he was again, his, uh, this thought came, I have to go back to my father, I cannot sustain myself. And when he was returning back, he was anticipating, my father is most probably going to be angry with me. He's not going to accept me. I have wasted his wealth. But when he was coming back, his father saw him from a long distance. It's the father who ran, brought him back home, and there was a huge celebration, a huge feast to celebrate the son's homecoming. This story indicates God has created to experience his own love. So he has created this creation so that he, by being alone, he cannot experience his love. He's experiencing the love how? By creating the second one so that he reciprocates the love. The question comes, if it's really true that he wants that we should love him, why have he not created us in such a way? He has not programmed us in such a way that we always love him. Why he have created in such a way that we always go away from him? Know it for one certain one thing. You can never love a robot. You can never love a robot. If he would have made us in such a way, we were programmed in such a way that we are bound to love him, he would never experience the love. It is just like loving a robot. It has been programmed to love him. To love, there must be a choice. God has given us eyes, ears to move out. At last, we get fed up. We get tired. We turn around. God is eternally expect, waiting for us to turn around. And there, in this turning around, lies all the spirituality, lies all the morality, lies all the question of brother, brotherhood. And that's where we all are aiming to go. So with this, I stop my discussion. Thank you.